Well, good morning. We want to welcome you here to First Baptist Church of Lloyd. That video reminded me, I think it was about three, four years ago, uh, we had our pack and pray for the shoe boxes, and uh, Charles Willingham brought in these huge old shoes, a big pile of them. And it was, I tell you, it was quite the challenge for Betty and the other ladies to figure out how to get those shoes in those shoe boxes to fit and put other stuff in, but they stuffed the, the, the shoes full of stuff. They, they made them fit, and uh, it worked out great. And you can see the results of that. God knows who's going to get each box. And so, again, we hope that just in his pro providential plan that, again, the, the boy who needs them to wear those shoes to do his life then gets them and, and, and goes on from there and, and, again, gets that gospel message. Again, we have set aside in our missions fund and stuff to provide the postage that's going to send these boxes with that extra part of the, the sharing the gospel, the program that they can come back. And again, missionaries use those to, again, get groups going and get the kids. And as you saw in the video, the whole family's involved in hearing the gospel and involved in their local churches there. Uh, we have a lot of opportunities coming up. And so for the shoe boxes, now it's the bring them back part. Don't take any more shoe boxes. Just bring them back. I want to challenge you as you shop this week, pick up one additional thing and make sure you go ahead and bring that next Sunday and donate it. Uh, next Sunday at 5 p.m., we're going to have that packing party. And again, that's where we need all the stuff. The, Miss Christie will have it all set up in the fellowship hall, all laid out for us to grab an empty box, pack it up, fill it tight, and then they'll check it and then get it ready to ship out, uh, take to the local uh, collection place, then goes on to the national collection places and goes on from there. So again, final week for the uh, shoe boxes. And again, Miss Christie says, if you do not have time to shop, give her the money and she will go shop for more stuff to put in the boxes. And so that will be a great thing to do. Uh, don't forget we have Silver Saints coming up uh, this Thursday. So come at 11 a.m. for that. Uh, if you're interested, they are going to get a group together to go to the Veterans Day Parade then the next day, uh, November 11th. So come to Silver Saints to get the details about who's going to the Veterans Day Parade and where you can meet for that. And then we've got, again, next Sunday, the Shoebox Ministry Packing Party at 5 p.m., uh, Lift Bible Study next Monday, uh, be in the second uh, Monday. And then we go on from there, Youth Painting with a Purpose. Get signed up for that in the back. That'll be in two weeks at 3 p.m. Today, the choir has something special, so come to choir practice after uh, church today. If you want to uh, get ready to get ready to sing for the, uh, the uh, Night of Lights in December, and we're also going to have a chili cook-off today later at one of the uh, uh, choir members' homes, so come, come to choir if you want more details about how to participate in that. And then in three weeks, we have men's Bible study. And then, of course, we have our Thanksgiving holiday, so check that out. And again, there's more November calendars back there to do that. And again, we do want to welcome you this, uh, this week as we look ahead to um, Veterans Day. And we have something special for you this in the, in the service today. But let's go to prayer, the, the Lord in prayer right now. Father God, we come to you. We thank you. We praise you. We thank you for when we look back on the history of our country and each, each branch of the military was formed for a, a specific purpose. Lord, men and women rose up at each time to, to provide those um, the opportunities for the men and women to serve their country, but also to, again, to, to fight for our freedom and even give their lives if necessary. We thank you for that. We thank you for this great country that we live in that provides that opportunity. And, Lord, just provides us those freedoms through that, that method. And we want to seek to honor our veterans uh, this coming week. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Today we want to celebrate our veterans and we want to honor them and thank them. But first, we want to honor Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, for we are more than conquerors for him who saved us. So let's stand and sing together.
Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp about me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise up against me, in this I will be confident. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Thank you. Now the choir is going to present for you a song called A Salute to the Armed Forces. And military men, veterans, I would love for you to stand when you hear your anthem for your branch of service. And I would like the Navy and Coast Guard to join together and stand on Anchors Away. Thank you.
Thank you. Stand with me as we sing My Country Tis of Thee.
when we were on our trip, I heard that a lady in Florida had written that. And they performed it. And as we were talking, our first thought was, I wonder if we can get Kyla to sing that for us. Because on behalf of First Baptist Church of Lloyd, for all of you who served everywhere in every spot under the sun, it just occurs to me as I'm sitting there this morning, how much as Christians we could learn from a bunch of soldiers. And so thank you. Because you doing what you get to do gets this moment for me. I get to stand up here and say what I want and just how I think God wants me to say it. So may God bless you. Because this morning's sermon is not going to be easy. They asked me in Sunday school what I'm going to preach on and I said sex. And the whole group of them all looked at me and was like, I wonder if we can clean the kitchen, you know, kind of thing. No, that's not the only subject I'm going to talk about. But when you preach expository, it's what comes up next. So here's the situation. Last week I stumbled on a statement from a buddy of mine. They were writing some thoughts. And this morning I'd like to take a couple of his thoughts as my introduction. See, normally I share a story and maybe even try to make you laugh a little bit before I really get the truth of God's Word in your life. Unfortunately, this morning I actually don't have a lot of humor Uh, In fact, the truth be told, it's really God's word. You can agree with it or not. That's really up to you. But I'm telling you, this is the truth. And so it's like this. A friend of mine was writing this and the idea was, have you ever wondered why it was okay to do things at certain times? But then there's other times where those things you did are not okay. Let me give you a for instance. He was writing to ask his church, what would you think if he ministered differently on a Sunday morning instead of the norm? Instead of singing certain things, preaching certain things, this is what he wrote. What would you think if I said, we decided that sometimes, instead of having praise and worship music, we're just going to listen to some other famous pop stars instead? And sometimes instead of celebrating the Lord's Supper with bread and with juice, we might do it with a little bit of whiskey and pizza or nachos. Every once in a while, instead of having a sermon, why don't I just show a film instead? It doesn't necessarily have to be a bad one, but what if that was what was shown? Not, you know, not all the time. Just every once in a while. If we did that, Would you think that our church was a church that was totally devoted to God? See, I ask that question because it occurs to me that if we wouldn't tolerate such a thing on Sunday morning, why is it okay on a Friday or a Saturday night? And if doing those things might be considered an abomination to the temple of God, which we're in, and as you'll learn today, why is it okay to do it to this temple here before us? You see, the title of today's sermon is not our own. Jesus is calling us to live different lives than the world. And so this morning, as we go into prayer, I'm going to ask for two things this morning. Number one, I want us to pray over all our veterans and ask God to bless them. Because some of them are struggling both with health, mental and physical. And ask that God does a work in our own hearts this morning. So will you bow your heads? Let's pray together. Father, we love you. And we thank you for everything you've done. And for our veterans. And for their families. Lord, would you bless them? Help them? Some are doing quite well in your name. And others are struggling to make it through this day. And I ask that your spirit touch them. Give them healing emotionally, physically. And draw them and their families close to you this morning. Lord, before us, we have several prayer requests. But our simple ask is this. Change us from the inside out. And let your word wash over us and make us completely different. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week, I ended on the fact that you shouldn't share your personal business with everybody, especially the unsaved world, and that it's wrong to sue your Christian brothers and sisters, that you ought to seek wise people to help you navigate all of these problems and help you settle the matters that are in your life. Now, this morning, we're going to transition a bit. As Paul was writing the church at Corinth, there were those in the church that held a rather simple belief. And perhaps this morning, 
here today or watching online, you might share a simple belief, and this is this belief. I gave my heart to Jesus, so therefore I can do whatever I want to with my body. That's simply not the way it goes. Believe it or not, what we say and what we do matters. So Paul speaks the truth in verse 9, if you'll take a look. Here's what it says. Do you not know that the righteous, excuse me, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And as such, some were you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. And by our spirit, Excuse me, by the Spirit of our God. Some folks read this list, and what they consider is a thought that this is a complete list, maybe a modern day Ten Commandments, that if they break this, if they're one of those things, that somehow eternity in heaven doesn't wait for them, they'll be going to a place called hell. But that's not what Paul is actually addressing. He is saying that this is us at some point in our life. Were. As in past tense. You know the phrase used to be. So what made you different? If it wasn't you. If it was your friend. If it wasn't the fact that you cleaned up your life. To look good to God. As some do. In other words. I got to straighten out my life. Before I meet God. Paul says. Do not be deceived. That's our first point. Don't be deceived. You didn't do the cleaning. In fact. You were washed. You were sanctified. You are justified in Jesus' name. In the kingdom of God, I used to stumble over this, and now I'm embracing it. You ready? Used to be is okay when talking about your life. It's not okay to talk about it in the ministry context, but it's okay to talk about it in your life. I used to be a wretched, awful individual. Used to be. I used to be a guy that you didn't want to spend time with. Used to be. And I used to be the kind of guy that you wouldn't want to invite over to your home. Used to be. And that ought to be the phrase that brings us excitement every day. Is that you have no idea what I used to be, so maybe I ought to share it with you. I used to do this. Now, if we ask you privately what kind of sins used to be in your life, I imagine that some of you might say some sins that might make us blush. But don't you see that's the point? Is that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. So you must ask the question, what makes you righteous? And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we read it months ago, but of him, in verse 30, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. We used to be awful people. Let me say it in a different way as Paul said it. Do you know what we used to be? We used to be fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. But do you know what happened? We met Jesus. That's the change in our life. And the righteousness of Christ, it took over our lives and praise God. You know what? I'm not that way anymore. My life and your life is a life that is changed because of Jesus' righteousness became our unrighteous. Or excuse me, became our righteousness. We're no longer unrighteousness because Jesus took over. Church, it would seem like people don't understand that there's a process to salvation. You know, they might think Jesus just kind of steps out and goes, Okay, such and such is saved. But folks, I'm telling you, that's cheap. It's meaningless. If you say out loud today, well, I believe in Jesus. And that's it as far as it goes for you. I got news for you. The devil believes in Jesus and he is not going to heaven. So Paul spelled out a process for us to understand the righteousness of a holy God. First of all, you need to recognize how dirty you are. For any of you who have ever spent time with middle school or high school boys... 
I present to you not having girls that I cannot relate, so maybe your daughter or granddaughter can relate, but in my experience, the most stinky people in the history of life is Pastor Jared. You see what I did there? All my boys were crawling under the couch, but no, it used to be me. It used to be me that smelled terrible. And do you know what happened in life? Is that I realized that I needed to be washed up. But you don't know that you need to be washed up unless you realize how dirty you are. Billy Graham used to say it quite simple. Maybe people don't realize they need a Savior because they don't realize they're lost. And so you need to get cleaned up a bit. But there's a snag for some of you. You see, some people think that they can clean up their lives. For many, when they're dirty, instead of jumping in the shower or a bath and letting it do it, they try to use the hose on themselves outside. And then they clean up their body. And then what happens is they seem to follow immediately with this whole attitude, I need to jump in the shower so I can get really clean. That was the pre-wash cycle. And some of us treat God that same way. God, I'm going to fix my life. I'm going to dot all the I's and cross all the T's and I'm going to get all my ducks in a row. And then once I do that, I'll then start living for you because then you'll really shine. Do you know what makes you shine? Is when you go to Jesus and His righteousness. He polishes you in a way that you didn't even know needed polishing. And so I present to you this simple thought that when you spend your life doing pre-washes for God and then allowing God to take over at some later date, that that is a terrible idea, a waste of time and resources. And Paul agrees this is what you need to know is that Jesus does all the cleaning. Why? Because you can't cleanse your sin. You'll never be clean enough physically because why we learn that you keep taking showers you keep taking baths but jesus says i've got a better solution for you when i cleanse you it is done it is finished so what happens is you need to realize that you need a washing now paul spelled out this process for us before a holy god he said paul said i was just like everybody else i was dirty And I acted like everybody else. And my sentence was to be placed in hell with everybody else. Despite what you may believe, your children growing up are not angels. And for anybody who's ever babysat anybody in life, they may quickly realize that one of the greatest forms of birth control is serving children at a certain level. Can I get a small amen? And I meant small, by the way. I appreciate y'all doing that. Because apart from Jesus, everybody's the same. Everybody's the same. And this is what Paul has to say. So he's going to wash you up. And then he's going to do something special for you. It's called being sanctified. And if you're new in our church or watching online, you need to know that's a fancy word of saying that Jesus got into your life and set you apart. And instead of you going to hell like all these other folks, He set you aside. Now, I like to be set aside whenever good things happen to me. I like to be lumped into a group when it's all bad. Do you all follow that? When somebody wants to bless me or do something nice for me, I like to be set apart. I don't mind a spotlight. I don't mind a boy. If I win, I might. I actually, I'd like to be the only winner. Anybody? But if something bad's going down, I want to be in a big, huge group so that we're all lumped in together. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the perfect expl- explanation of sanctified is that when things are bad, they're all lumped. But here's the truth. When it comes to sanctified, he pulls you aside and he deals with you one on one. Nobody else can pay for your sin. Nobody else can save you. Nobody else can set you aside and do a miracle in your life. I can't glorify anybody, including myself. 
And so when it came time to be recognized for salvation, I couldn't set myself apart, but Jesus steps in. And Jesus approved me for salvation. You have to be approved for this. And He sanctified, He set us apart. And so Paul spelled this out. You were really dirty and you needed to be washed. You needed to be pulled out of this bad group, so to speak. You needed to be set apart. And then it says that Jesus justifies you. That's a fancy way of saying He saved your soul forever. Let me rephrase that in a different way. You ready? Because you didn't save you, you can't lose it. You can't misplace it. You can't do something so bad that Jesus goes, man, I set that joker apart, and man, I, it, that's it. He's going back in the herd. That doesn't work. It doesn't preach. The truth of God's Word is that once He's washed you, you're clean. Once you're sanctified and set apart, and now you're going to be justified, it's finished. And so praise God. But there's some other important things that you need to know through this passage. See, without this process, we have nothing but hell waiting for us. So one of the questions I always get asked, every single week for 25 years, I believe I've been asked this question, my friend said a prayer and was baptized when they were a kid. But it seems like they're currently breaking seven of the ten things that you just read. Okay, that was a paraphrase. Did you like what I did there? Paul mentioned this list, and this is the question they always ask. Are they going to heaven? Well, what they're really asking is, why hasn't this person changed? Why hasn't this person changed? Why don't people change? Perhaps it's because they never met Jesus. They weren't washed. They weren't sanctified. They weren't justified. They might have even said a prayer. Folks, I've said a lot of prayers, and a lot of them were without power. When I was 16 years old, I didn't know Jesus, and I sat in a Bible class and said, Dear Jesus, if you'll give me a Mustang, I'll take people to church. But that must have not hit. I did ask for a Mustang convertible. But there was only one problem. One, I didn't know Jesus. And second, I wasn't even going to church. God can't be bribed and He can't be conjoled. And so here's the truth of it. They may have said a prayer, but they actually never believed in their heart and they never followed Him with obedience. Or, Paul says, they may be deceived. They may think that if they say a prayer that they're fine, that they can do whatever they want to with their body, or who indeed they actually worship. In other words, they're ignorant. They're not discipled. Oswald Chambers said something powerful. He says, we begin trusting our ignorance and we call it innocence. And by trusting our innocence, and we call it purity. Well, I just didn't know. And whenever we hear statements like what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 18, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. We'll shrink and we say, but I didn't really feel that in my heart. So here's the truth. Either Jesus is the supreme authority of our human heart, or He's not worth paying attention to. And that's where some people are at. That I'll give Jesus my life once my life comes together. If that's your mentality, you're not going to heaven. And so I hope in some capacity that this will hit your life and your heart this day. Because here's the truth. As long as you try to remain ignorant, deceived, or just play an innocence card like I didn't know... You'll need to know that you become what is called a fool's paradise. And the only thing that safeguards us in life is that we claim Jesus and He changes us from the inside out. Do you know that you can't worship idols that you have strategically placed in your life and then on Sunday morning, come to church and go, Jesus Christ, forgive me, I knew exactly what I was doing. Do you know that that doesn't make any sense? That it's a contradiction in terms? Light, as Apostle John said, light and darkness actually don't go hand in hand. That or, in this context, 
when people go, well, if light and darkness don't go hand in hand, then why haven't they changed? Maybe we ought to just add the word prideful. That it's their body and they're going to do what they want to with it and you can't tell them anything different. Do you know that God condemns sexual sins? Did you know that He condemns theft? Did you know that He condemns idolatry? That Paul names some of these things in 1 Corinthians because he said in the day that idolatry and sensuality, they actually go hand in hand. That there's a great deal of sexual laziness in the city at Corinth. The idea that God can have the heart, but I'll take the mind and I'll take the body and I'm going to do whatever I want to with it and he ought to be satisfied with what he can get. If I went to my wife and goes, just be grateful for what I give you and not what you don't have, what kind of marriage do you think I'd have? What kind of marriage do you not have anymore? You see, don't you understand that because sex was a normal physical function, worship of yourself is actually normal in a worldly sense? That the church began adopting the mindset that, why don't I just do it as I see fit? Paul pointed out something important. Did you know that God created you? And did you know that He created sex? That He created the first man and the woman, and therefore He has the right for all of eternity to tell us how to live our lives? Did you know that the Bible has great illustrations and ideas that put forth to not just in dating, but into marriage, including sex? You know, I've debated on this subject a whole lot this week. Because I thought, you know what? I'm in North Florida, which I hear is a lot like South Georgia. And I wondered, if I came in today, how prideful and prudeful we'd all be. Y'all ready to go on a quick journey? Ladies and gentlemen, if you're new to church, this actually may get me fired today. Let's have some fun today. Ready? All right, here we go. Paul pointed out, That because the Bible is an owner's manual in order to tell you how to live a life, you need to understand living your life is not based on how you feel. It's not based on how you feel. You see, church, your body isn't really yours anymore. In fact, the Bible says that we actually get a brand new body one day just to complement the one He gave us. And in verse 12, this is what it reads. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and stomachs for food, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. And so i got to ask each and every one of you, who has the power in your life? Because if you follow that up by saying, well, I've got the power... My life has lived how I want to. Or if you say someone else has the power, both of those answers are actually wrong. That only one has the power, and his name is Jesus, and I'm pretty sure that's not your name. I know even if it's your middle name, you don't have his power when you live a sin-filled life apart from him. So there was some things you need to know. At the church of Corinth, they served a lot of different gods. Some were sexual, some were idols that represented something. Some were substances and others were items and stuff. If you've ever heard in church world, some some people's idols have four legs and some have two. All right, one of the interesting things is you need to know that all those idols that you created, nothing, nothing is comparison to the God of eternity. So, some of you might say, well, I mean, I have grace. What does it matter if I slip up every now and again? Well, first, let's call it what it is. Your slip up, it's actually called sin. And then you might say, well, Jesus has forgiven me of my sins, and He's going to continue to forgive me of my sins. Ladies and gentlemen, you know what, church? Jesus does forgive our sins. And He promises to continue to forgive our sins. But you need to learn something else. And this is my point number two. Just because you can, doesn't mean that you should. 
Just because you can do something sinful doesn't mean that you should. Not everything you do is actually helpful. I spoke weeks ago how some people in life, they share their testimony and they say, well, I'm glad I went through this sinful time in my life because look at where I'm at today. I'm telling you, that's wrong thinking. We need to be glad of the grace of Jesus Christ because He's the only one who could bring good out of all that bad that you've gone through. It's never good that we sin. It's never a great idea that you sinned and did this and did that and I messed over my work and I messed over my spouse and I messed over my family. I've never counseled a person coming in my room and go, I'm so glad my dad did this to my family. I'm so glad that my mama did this at work. It just turned out wonderful for me since I'm full of bitterness and anger and frustration and I don't trust people like crazy. You see, don't you understand that we need to be glad of God's grace because we used to be terrible people. And so don't sit here today thinking, well, I'm glad I'm not like such and such. You are. Apart from the grace of Jesus Christ, you are them. And the only difference between them and us is that we are blessed to have a personal relationship with Jesus. You see, church, Paul said that our bodies and our lives are made with a purpose. And that purpose is actually God's glory. Paul said that he created our bodies and one day he's going to resurrect them in glory. Now, that for a different message, I'm, I'm going to tell us how I believe some of that will pan out. But today, since God created us for a purpose, do you know that since we have such incredible moments, both good and bad, in our lives, that we have a more incredible future waiting for us when you meet Jesus? And since we got this amazing thing that is happening in our life, how can we use our bodies for evil? For some of you who have children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews, you understand what I mean on this one, don't you? When you give to them and give to them and give to them, and you bless them in such significant ways, Does it ever blow your mind that they could then take the gift you gave them and just absolutely just throw it away? Does that not astound you? So, when we use the argument that it's my body and I can do what I want to, isn't the truth that you're serving your own body at that point? Your body will become what guides you. My body anticipates every desire that I have and I'll begin moving everything out of my way in order to satisfy that in my body. Do you know that goes for food? It goes for sex, reproduction, everything else like drugs and alcohol too. You know church, bodies make a terrible and puny God because as I get older, do you know that my body has betrayed me? I don't see as good as I used to. My ears don't work as good as I do and my muscles are never quite what they used to be. Can I get an amen? Wait a minute, are y'all amen in my body or yours? i will make sure that was there. Here's something other. Sometimes a different argument is used like, well, I need to take care of myself. When you use the argument that if I don't take care of myself, that nobody else will, then I need to look out for myself because nobody knows me like I do. I call faults. God made you and nobody knows you like God does. Otherwise, that would make Him not God. He knows you. He knows what you need. He even knows what you want. Good, bad, and ugly. And the truth of the matter is that if you feel the need to be the one that takes care of yourself all the time, you need to understand some things. What do you need God for? For the only one that looks out for themselves, what they're really saying is nothing's off limits. How about this? If nothing is off limits, then who do we really serve? The answer is you. And what do you do if you do something just the reason that you're not moving heaven and earth to worship you? But we don't do that, do we? We try to play both sides of the fence, right? We try to have feet in both camps. God, I'll take care of all the little stuff. You take care of all the big stuff. And that'll make for one real sweet moment. But see, therein lies the problem. Your plan probably consists of how to get through a day. 
or maybe a week or a month at best. And for all of you type A hyper planner people that might even when they sit down in an interview and they ask you this question like, how do you see yourself in five years? God has seen you from before you were born and he knows the hour that you die. Who's going to be able to plan your life better than him? The God who created you is calling you to live differently. And when you use this kind of theology that the early church at Corinth had, that nothing is off limits, or I'm going to take care of me, and all these different avenues, what kind of life is lived without boundaries? You'll become a slave to your selfish desires. You know how I know that's true? You know I can't preach a sermon without mentioning food, and it's actually in the text. So y'all got to give me grace on this one. You ready? I went on a cruise. And for any of you who have ever been on a cruise, you know they serve food for a consistent period of time. Do you know that no matter what, even when I ate breakfast, I was still hungry for a second breakfast? I thought that was going to get a laugh. I actually put, ha ha. <laughs> Did you know I was hungry for lunch? Oh, by the way, I was hungry for that 3 o'clock ice cream. Oh, and I was hungry for dinner. And then let's not forget the, the pre-show snack. You see where I'm going with this, don't you? For all of you who are like, well, that's just crazy. It's amazing how many people eat, 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 eat that Thanksgiving meal and they're hungry three hours later. So before y'all look at me like I'm crazy, when you say to your life that nothing is off limits and that you're going to experience life to the, all of these things for you, it'll never be enough. Your new item you bought, you're just going to want another one. Wreck your family for a different one, you'll want another one. Mess over your boss so that you can go to a different company, you'll, you'll end up being unhappy there. Don't you see, sin is never fully satisfied. And Paul says, if you'll put your life in the grace of Jesus Christ, He will satisfy you from the in and out and throughout all of eternity. Paul uses, at this point, sexual desires to make a point. Since the church had people sleeping with harlots and incest, there was a son sleeping with a stepmom. And it was going through all the church. And to make matters worse, the church was actually defending their actions. And so Paul had two arguments that he brought out that the church at Corinth, and if this describes you, or if this describes you watching online, there's some things you need to know. The church at Corinth used this as a, a, an excuse for what they did. In other words, first, all things are lawful for me. This was a popular phrase at Corinth. In other words, it was based on this false view of Christian freedom. We're not under the Old Testament any longer. We're set free from Jesus Christ. We have not been set free, though, so we can enter that kind of bondage. Jesus didn't set you free to sin more. And so on Friday, it occurs to me, we're going to celebrate these veterans. Now, I think they deserve more than a parade, and I think they deserve more than an attaboy, but nonetheless, I hope they hear my heart this morning because they taught me a valuable lesson this week. I'm reminded, having seen some of the films and studied some of the history, about some of the battles they fought, both here in our land and abroad. It occurs to me that our veterans have helped set countries free, not just ours. That they restored order where there was chaos. They allowed democracy and rights to be restored. That they recognized that just because other countries could do something doesn't make it right. They wanted people to see the right thing to do. And I began to think, how would veterans free feel if they fought for our freedom only to see the community of people they set free go right back into slavery? Nothing says thank you to a veteran more than, hey, thanks for making my world a better place, but I really like the devil I knew. And so what does that say to Jesus Christ? Jesus, thank you for saving me. 
Thank you for taking care of me and forgiving me from everything that I've ever done wrong for all of eternity. But truth be told, I really enjoyed my sin and I just would like to do what I want to do without your influence in my life. I know that if we said that to a veteran, I just about believe part of them would think, well, then what did I do it for? But God knows your heart. And He's never going to stop extending that grace in hopes that your heart will change. When Jesus came into our life, the battle of sin versus forgiveness had been won. But as Christians, we need to ask a few questions. One, is this thing I'm about to do, is that what's right? Uh, Not right to me, but actually right to God. As Christians, we need to ask ourselves, will this put me back into bondage? In other words, am I taking three steps forward and only to take four steps back? We need to ask questions like, is this actually profitable for my spiritual life? For all of you growing folks who think about retirement funds and you think about finances and bills and life and all these things. Isn't it interesting that people spend more time looking at their bank accounts and credit card statements and loan packages and retirement things than they do sitting down going, okay, here's my accounting list, God. This day I really listened to you and this day I didn't. Here's a pattern in my life and I'd like to invest more into this for you. Maybe as Christians there's more people who worship money than they do Jesus. The church at Corinth, because they had these arguments that defended their sexual desires, here's one that they pulled out. Food is for the stomach and stomach is for the food. Now I agree with that, by the way. I don't have a problem with that scripture. Um, But here's what they really meant. In other words, they treated sex as simply an appetite that must be satisfied and not one that was a gift and something that could be cherished. Now, I'm not a prude. Something important you need to know, I'm 43 years old, turning 44, I'm not a prude. And I once heard a pastor stand up and they talked about marriage things. So married folks, I want you to stay with me this day. But single folks, this part's for you. You ready? I really enjoy eating. You like how we equate that to sex? But I wonder what it would be like if I was invited over somebody's house and they cooked me a wonderful meal. And then when they asked my thoughts, I just simply replied, eh, I was due. It was fine. I mean, it met a need. Or what if I walked into somebody's house and I saw cake sitting on the table and without asking, I just kind of helped myself. And when the host walked in, they got angry with me and my reply was, I was hungry, what's the big deal? I mean, what if they were saving that cake for somebody else? Ladies and gentlemen, in marriage, it occurs to me something very valuable. When I was growing up, In the church, nobody really ever talked about sex except what? Don't do it. And there's many young couples that come into my office and they might view sex differently than you do. And so here's my growing theory. You ready, church, for all that know me? You see how I have these running theories? I believe because the church hasn't addressed the subjects of sex because it may make us feel a little weird or a little awkward or a little bashful. Here's where young people and including older people where they learn about sex from TV and movies and romance novels. And I'm here to tell you, despite those many comedic moments in my life on TV, that is not how my life has panned out. Has it panned out that way for you? See, some of y'all are afraid to answer because you're thinking somebody's looking at you. It's just me. So listen, did you know that sex was supposed to be intimate and special? Did you know that it's supposed to connect the bride and a groom in such a significant way that it was never intended to just be an appetite that was satisfied and moved on? 
Sex outside of marriage, it is absolutely destructive. But you need to know that in marriage, sex can be creative and wonderful and can link you closer together in a deeper way and including your prayer life. Did you know that sex within marriage, it not only leads to a growing family, but a growing heart? That Paul equates it that it's more than just food for the stomach and stomach for the food, but that it actually grows you as an individual. But sex outside of marriage leads to this phrase, and I hate saying this, but it's so true. There are people who do not want the pregnancies that they have. And it leads to broken lives. Just because we have normal desires, some people believe that they must give in to those normal desires no matter what the circumstances is. And so I thought, you know, to shop and to laugh, those are normal desires. But if you shop till you're broke, that's a bad idea. And if you're laughing at all the wrong moments in life causes you to lose relationships... Maybe you ought to learn timing in your laughter. But when you shop at the right time, and you laugh at the right time, do you know that's a huge blessing? I need you to think about God, our Father and Creator. And He didn't make you so that you could do what you want and then ask Him to fix your sins, but not your life. And do you know that God has something bigger for you? So listen to me, married folks, before I hit this last section of verses. They ask me how long I'm taking. I'm taking the full time. You ready, married folks? Your children, your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews, if you laugh at all the TV shows where the guy or the girl never gets enough or they go outside of their family in order to satisfy their supposed needs, And you don't share with them the truth that you love your wife and your husband. And you can't wait to go off on a romantic weekend. You don't have to go into detail. But if they don't think any romance is in your life, why do they think that romance will be in their life when they're married? If you don't share with them the truth that Jesus loves you and blessed you with the spouse you have, why on earth would they want to get married? Do you know that marriages, the actual numbers, that they're down? Excuse me, I I said that correct, but I actually meant something else. Did you know that divorces are actually down? The number of divorces, they're actually down? Do you know why? People aren't getting married. They live together. They have babies. 15, uh, chapter 6, verse 15, it says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make the members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee also, this is what it says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, whom you not your own? And I start thinking, well, this is my body and I need to do what I want. When my whole life is lived in desperation for a brand new body. I really want a brand new body. Let me tell you what I'd like when I go to heaven. I'm not chasing a rabbit here. Stay with me. You ready? I'd like hair. Now, let me rephrase that. I don't mean just on my face. I actually mean up here. Just saying some some nice locks would go a long way. Just throwing that out. You know what I'd like? I'd like muscles that work at a consistent level and don't break down on me when I try to lift anything that I used to lift. But now, that's what happens to me. And so when we start saying things like, I can't wait on this brand new body, do you not know that right here, right now, that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that God resides in you? It's not yours anymore. He claimed it. And He wants you from the inside out. Now, I know that isn't a popular point in our world today. But a believer's body is a member of the body of Christ. And Paul is asking, how can we be joined to Christ and then join in sin at the same time? 
It astounds Paul and it ought to astound us, both in the early church though, and in our world today, it seems like the church at Corinth saw no harm in visiting the temple prostitutes and committing fornication and adultery. By the way, there was a thousand of them at the temple of Aphrodite. They could have their choice. But do you know why there's a thousand? Because Christians weren't standing up and going, enough is enough. If Christians would stand up against sexual sin, do you know that some of that sexual sin would lessen? Church, when you read or watch something sexual, you may get the impression that it's kind of funny to sleep with multiple people or to wake up the next morning to know that you were with someone, but you don't remember who they were. And so where are shows and movies where they make humor of this? Do you know that God looks at it differently? Paul referred to the creation account in which he explained the seriousness of sexual sin. He said that when a man and a woman join together, that their entire personality is totally involved. That they give of themselves completely. That it's the deeper oneness than ever before. And it has lasting consequences. For all of you who have gone through a divorce. I'm really sorry about that. I imagine that is one of the most hurt. Filled experiences in life. Because unlike a death where your spouse has died. You see that person living, breathing, and active in your life. And maybe all the time. But God didn't mean it for that way. When I ask a couple that I'm marrying at the altar. That if they'll forsake other people and be joined together in holy matrimony. I'm not asking if they forsake all the people they don't like. But for the people they do, that's okay. Listen church, I'm not a prude. And I know life is lived and they often say that, what is it, sex is the oldest profession. But Paul's telling us we can be different. That when they commit a sexual sin, that it's a sin committed against his own body. It involves the whole person. It involves our Heavenly Father. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit in you, whom you have from God, that you're not your own any longer? You're bought at a price. He owns you. He has the right to tell you how to live a life. And that God lives within each of us personally. And when you sin, you're not glorifying God in this manner. You're actually just glorifying sin. Church, your body isn't yours anymore. And so unlike what you hear debated today, sex is not just a part of the body. Being a male or being a female, it involves the total person. And that's why a sexual experience affects all the personality. Your body isn't yours anymore. And so when he sat down, to plan out your life. He knew what gender you ought to be. He knew what was best for you. He made you that way on purpose. And for some this morning, you may feel like a different gender. But I'm telling you, it's wrong to base your life on feelings. If we based everything on feelings, some of you wouldn't be at work on Monday because you just don't feel like going. If we based everything on feelings, you wouldn't be married to that same spouse you have for 38 years. By the way, if you're here and married 38 years, I didn't mean you specifically. You know that, don't you? If we base life on feelings, some of you wouldn't feel saved because of the sin in your life. But we're not ours anymore. Christ saved you. And He bought you. Don't you see how amazing of a moment that is? When you are at your very worst, God looked into your life and bought the very worst version of you. Now, I always like to put my best foot forward, but with God, He bought me at my worst. And since He bought me at my worst, and He's pouring so much into me, 
then why do I continue to live a life of sin? We're not ours anymore. And because we are into a brand new creation, it occurs to me that there are many struggling to fit in. They feel like they don't fit into their body, their home, their job, even their life. But the truth is found in God's Word that we belong to the Father who made us, the Son who saved us, and the Spirit that lives within us. And so it's time, church, it's time to stand up for what's right according to God's holy word. And so a major theme for each and every one of us is to listen, to believe, and to obey. God's word is the same for every single one of us. It's all presented the very same. The Bibles read the same. The study is there the same. And he's talking the same message to each and every one of us. And so I got to ask, did you listen? I mean, I know you heard what I said. I know you heard what God had to say to you. But did you actually listen to the Word of God? And see, God's Word is expecting you to believe right here, right now. Do you believe that God has a purpose for you? That when He created you and purchased you, He now life according to His will. And that right here, God expects you to obey. Are you willing to show God? Are you willing to show the world that you believe in Him by listening and being obedient to His Word? So this morning, are you a thief? It's time to ask forgiveness and it's time to stop stealing. What idols do you have in your life? As we've learned, people have themselves as an idol. It can be a relationship. Honey, anything that you'll move heaven and earth in order to get more of is something you'll worship. And so it's time to ask forgiveness. It's time to tear down those idols in your life. Jesus is the only one worth worshiping. Finally, this morning, this is my last moment, is are you committing sexual immorality? Now, that's a fancy way of saying, are you having an adulterous affair? Which is having sex with somebody who isn't your spouse. Are you homosexual sex with anybody that you can? And although this didn't make it to the list, it's worth adding into pornography. Are you using it to satisfy your need? I know that there's some today who will say, well, I don't lust after her, I just look at her naked. Or I guess in this context, it could be a woman looking at a guy. But the Bible says that these are the types of sins that sin against your own body as well as against Christ. It's time to be different. Your dads, your friends, they may have done some of these things but do you know that you don't have to? Your mom, your work neighbors, whoever you went to school with, they may have lived this kind of life, but God is expecting you to be different. Do you know that much is expected of us since Christ purchased us? Ken Walker wrote in the Christian Reader about a six foot two, 280 pound fellow by the name of Clay Shriver, uh, Shiver. Some of y'all may know him. He was a center for the 1995 Florida State Seminole football team. He was regarded as an All-American to come, and so when Shiver got the word that Playboy magazine planned to name him to its All-American team, he prepared his response. He said, thanks, no thanks. I don't want to let anybody down, and number one on the list is God. In his response, Clay Shiver quoted Luke 12, 48, and it said, To whom much is given, from him much will be required. Are you letting God down? Ladies and gentlemen, here's where I close by simply saying, maybe you are someone who is active in this kind of lifestyle, but you don't have to anymore. I used to be that. But because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, I'm no longer that. And I don't know what your that is. 
Maybe you've invented your own category and it wasn't in that 10. But do you know that Jesus Christ can forgive you for that? And so this morning we're going to sing a song. And there really is a Jesus Christ. And He is inviting you. He wants to buy you at your very worst. Will you come and talk to Him this morning? And for those of you this morning who met Jesus Christ years ago, but you're still struggling in the same sins that you have in the past, it's time to be used to be. It's time to come forward. Maybe you need to come at the altar. Maybe you need to kneel right where you're at. I don't know, but it's time to be a used to be. It's time to put your life into place saying, okay, God, take over. When you're set free, do you really want to go back into bondage? Will you come and join me in the freedom and the blessing of Jesus Christ? Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. And we thank you. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your grace. Thanking just absolutely that when we were at our worst, you love us completely. And so God, I thank you that I'm not like that anymore. And so for all those who are struggling, for all those who need forgiveness to be washed clean, would you meet them right where they're at? Ours is a life that needs to be changed. Jesus, you're the only one who can do it. We pray that prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? Would you come? I made a comment to my wife that earlier this week. I said, uh, I don't think anybody's going to come forward. And she said, well, why not? I said, because I'm going to preach on sex. And somebody in the group's going to think they got a sex problem. <laughs> now, I say that with humor because we're not prudes, but rather Jesus loves us. Here's something I need all of you to know. From one Baptist pastor to the heart of people, I don't know if you'll ever hear this from other people. I want everybody I know to be at every worship service and Bible study we ever have. Having said that, if you come to me and you say, I'm taking my wife or my husband and we're going to go off on a romantic weekend, you have my blessing and my prayers and I'll even offer to give you a Dairy Queen blizzard. <laughs> it sure would be nice to hear that you've been thinking about one another rather than hearing about couples who are living together, who do all these things together, except to be married. And so folks, may God bless you. And I hope you have a wonderful day and share stories and laughter and take you a nap. And for all of you who are in the choir, we're going to have an awesome afternoon. There's tons of activities coming up this month as we go through it. Are you thankful for your spouse? And that's where we're going to start today. Are you thankful for them? And if you're not, our office is right over there across the field. I'd like to spend some time with you on how you can learn to be thankful for one another instead of just fighting with one another. If you're in a relationship and you're living in a way that you know is not right according to God's Word, 
we need to talk about marriage. How healthily or we can do it privately, but I promise you as the Bible unfolds, it's better for you to be married than doing what you're doing. And so may God help you this day. And for all of you who enjoyed today's message, thank you. For all of you who'd like to get rid of me, now you know why I said it. Amen? <laughs> Let's close in prayer. God, we love you and we thank you and you have set us free. And so we want to live in that freedom. God, we want to enjoy every moment you've given us. Not because we want to sin more. We just want to bask in your blessing. And so thank you, Lord, for family. Thank you for friends. And thank you for what you did for us. We pray that prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.